Good morning. We are closing in on the end of our time in 1 John, and it's kind of surreal to me because this is the letter that we started going through when, I, um, when God called my family and I here to, to Cornerstone, and it's kind of crazy to think that we are just about done with this letter. Uh, one of the reoccurring themes in this letter is assurance of salvation. It's the question of, are we genuinely saved? And John brings this up because the church that he's been writing to, as we have seen, has been infiltrated by false teachers that came up from within the church. And he's seeking to encourage the body that is left, the body that is still there and saying, this is what it looks like to be saved. This is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. But what's interesting about how John writes is that in his gospel and in this letter is that his purpose statement doesn't come until the end of the letter. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 20, verse 31 and, uh, 30 and 31, John says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John writes in his Gospel about who Jesus is so that those who don't know Christ would know who Christ is. So they would know without a doubt that this is Jesus and that by putting your faith and trust in Jesus, you might have life. But in his letter, the purpose is a little bit different. The purpose is not to call to those who don't believe to believe. The purpose is to write to Christians so that they would know that they have eternal life that they would have assurance and having confidence in knowing that this is my Savior and he has me. And so as we look at our passage this morning, if you're taking notes, the two main things that I would like us to take away is first that we have assurance, that we have assurance that we have eternal life as Christ followers. And the second is that because of our assurance, this leads us to going before our Lord in prayer. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open up to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 13 through 15 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the seats around you, uh, but we will also have the, the passages on the screen this morning if you would like to refer to the screen as well. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, please let me know and we'd be happy to get one in your hands um, by whatever means necessary. So, I would also like to invite you to stand for the reading of the word of our Lord this morning, if you are able. We stand because we stand out of reverence for the word of God, that this is God's word, that he breathed this out through the human authors so that we would know what he has to say to us and what we have before us is good and profitable for all things pertaining to life and godliness. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, it says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. This is the word of our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it would be your word that is proclaimed, that is not anything that I have to say or anything that comes from my mouth or my mind or my heart, but instead it comes from you and that if it is not from you, that it would fall on deaf ears, but that if it is from you, if there's anything that you would have your church hear, um, if it would be anything that anyone in these seats would hear, that it would be in their hearts and in their minds, that it would cause them to see you in a greater and more prominent way. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, John writes, as we have said, this letter to provide us with assurance of eternal life, to say that if you believe in the name, you know that you have eternal life. And there are some who might push back against this statement and say, well, how can you ever really know? How can you ever be totally confident and sure that you have eternal life? But John would push back against such a statement. In fact, this entire letter has been written so that we would know, so that we would have confidence that we have been saved. The reality is that salvation is a work of God. 
Salvation is by God and for God, and, and since God never lies, and since God always keeps his promises, and God sees everything through to the end, then of course we have confidence. Because salvation is not of our own doing, but of God's doing. God is the one that has given us life. And so if we go to chapter 5, verse 13, I'll read it one more time for us. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. To believe, he's talking to people who are in the act of believing. They're not those who believed at one point at one point and maybe don't believe anymore. He's not referring to those who will potentially believe down the road. He's speaking to those who are believing right now. That you believe, you are in the act of believing. You could read this verse as to you who are believing. And this is those who make up the church, the true church, not just people that sit in pews on a Sunday, but those who have genuine faith in Jesus Christ, that they are believing day in and day out that this is the Son of God. And he says, that those who believe in the name of the Son of God. And the question is, what does it mean to believe in the name of the Son of God? On Wednesday nights, we've been doing um, a, a dive into the Trinity, and understanding what is the Trinity. How can we understand that God is three in one, that he is Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons in one God. And as we've gone through our study, there have been, uh, last week we looked at the reality that there are some in recent history that would say that God is only what he does. That if there's anything that's said about, about who God says about himself, those things don't ultimately matter. It only matters that God is in his actions. But this severely misses what Scripture says about God. God has revealed himself in very particular and specific ways. He says many things about himself so that we can know who God is. And so we look at not only what God has said about himself, but we look at what God has done. We look at both of these things. And so when John says he is writing to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, he is referring to everything there is about the sun. Not picking particular parts of the sun that you like. Not picking any parts of Jesus that might benefit you more. There's no picking and choosing. This isn't a buffet where you get to have this part of Jesus and maybe not that part of Jesus. Those that believe in the name of the Son of God believe in everything there is about him. All of him. All encompassing. You believe that he is God that he is eternal, that he was from the beginning and he will be after the end. You believe that by him and through him and for him, all things are made. When you believe in the name of the Son of God, you believe that he is the exact imprint of the Father's nature. You believe that he is the Word, the Word of God, and you believe that the Word took on flesh. Not that any divinity was lost by the Son, but that he gained humanity. And that through his perfect humanity and his divinity, he walked this earth completely without sin and then was crucified on a cross, dying a sinner's death. That though he was completely without sin, if there was anyone who was perfect, he was perfect. He had no sin at all, yet he died a sinner's death, but death could not contain the Son of God. Death could not keep him in the grave. Instead, three days later, he rose from the dead, showing that he has victory over sin and over death. And if you believe in the name of the Son of God, then you believe that through his death and his resurrection, you have life. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that through his life, when you put your faith and trust in him, his life is given to you so that you now have eternal life. You are made righteous before God. But there are some who would try to believe in the name of Jesus and they would say that they, they only want certain parts. They only want the things that are advantageous to themselves. They only want the things that, that they like, the things that they're comfortable with. Or maybe they only want the parts that, that have some kind of social or, or, or maybe uh, other kinds of benefits. We only like the parts of Jesus that the world likes, like his love. Who's going to say no to someone who teaches us to be loving? 
So we're just going to focus on just that part of Jesus. Or maybe others, they just focus on the parts that make them feel good about themselves. Jesus says this, and that sounds pretty good to me, so I'm going to latch on to that part and nothing else. But as we've seen in this letter, that John is very clear, there is no halfway Christianity. There is no one foot in and one foot out. It's all or nothing. You are either saved or unsaved. And you either believe in all of Jesus or you don't believe Jesus at all. And that is the contrast that John gives all throughout this letter is that they believe, his audience believes in the name of the Son of God. They believe in all of Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves, is that who we believe? In the name of the Son of God or do we believe in a Jesus of our own construction? Do we believe in a Jesus that makes us comfortable, that allows us to sit back and just do as we please, whereas God says, no, believe in all of what my son has said about himself. John would say, so that you know, and a couple weeks ago we talked about the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. That head knowledge is meant to maybe persuade us on an intellectual level, that sometimes head knowledge can influence our emotions that head knowledge can maybe move us on an emotional level or, or change our understanding of something, but heart knowledge transforms. Heart knowledge is through the work of the Spirit, and heart knowledge gets into our, the very depths of our souls and says, no, I'm going to completely transform who you are from being dead in your sin to being made alive in Christ. And John says he wants them to know that they are Christ followers to know, to perceive, to see and to understand, to grasp with all of their senses, to know with every fiber of their being that they are without a doubt those who have eternal life. That's what he has written in this book. And to have, that we would have eternal life, it's not a possibility. It's not a hope for maybe I'll get it later. It's something that you lay hold to now. You have eternal life in Christ. When you put your faith and trust in him, you have him. There's no maybe, there's no so-so. It is definite. He's yours because you are his. The reality is that when you believe in the name of the Son of God, you are now an adopted child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and there is always a seat at his table. There is always a place for you because he is your heavenly father and our heavenly father cares for his children far above what we could ever possibly care for, even our own children. Christians, we know we have eternal life. We know that we have it. And we know that we have it based on what Christ has done, not on what we have done. We know that Christ died in our place. We know that he brought us to life. We know that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. We know that his blood has washed us clean of our sin and made us righteous before God. We know that he has forgiven us of our sin. And when he forgives us, forgives us of our sin, he has removed our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. We are forgiven of everything we have done before him. And John not only gives us in this letter that reassurance that salvation is by Christ and it's because of Christ's work that we are saved, but he also in this letter gives tests and evidences for every single believer. And so we can look at ourselves and what John has said in this letter and we can say, okay, do I match up with what is being said by John? Is there no longer a practice of sin in our life? Every single one of us sins, and John clearly spells that out in this letter, but do we no longer practice sin? In fact, I would go as far as to say, do we find sin repulsive? Do we find the things that are rebellion against God, do we look at those things and go, my goodness, I am rebelling against the very king that purchased me by his blood. Why would I continue to go back to the very thing he died for? Do we have a love for the world or a love for God? Do we look at the things around us and say, man, I have to have that. I need to have that next best job. I need to have the, the, the better promotion, the better paying thing. I need to have the next best toy. I need to have the best relationships. I need to get in with that person. Or are we more concerned with our love for God? 
And does that trump everything else? Do we have a love for our fellow believers? If you are a Christ follower, you are now a part of the body of Christ. You have been brought into a family. You have been adopted in as a fellow child of God. Therefore, you are part of something bigger than yourself. And when the body hurts, do you hurt? When the body celebrates, do you celebrate? When the body is in need, do you find how to fulfill that need? This is a body of Christ, and you show, as a Christ follower, you will have love for the body. As a Christ follower, you discern what you hear, and you are able to discern what is between true and what is false. Because we live in a world where there's a lot of falsehood, where there's a lot of those who would seek to tickle our ears, to tell us things that we want to hear so that we might feel better. But the Christian, through the power of Christ, can say, no, I see that, that what you're trying to tell me is false because I am found and rooted in Christ, and he has made it clear. There are many in the church today who find confidence in things that are not from Scripture. They find confidence in the fact that maybe they walked an aisle at one point in their life. There was an altar call and they went forward. Or maybe there are some who find confidence in the fact that they uttered a prayer at one point. They find confidence in their own actions. Well, I'm a good person. I do enough good things. And so because I'm a decent person and I'm not as bad as, well, that person over there, then I'm fine. But all of these things are fragile and empty. And could your salvation have been brought about by coming forward during an altar call? Yes, absolutely. But your faith is not in the altar call. Your faith is in Christ. You find confidence in Christ. You find confidence in his work Not an action that you did, but what he has done for you. And so we look to the Son with confidence. We look to him and we know without a shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life in him. And this is the confidence that we have. That confidence from Christ then leads us to bring bring what is on our heart and on our minds to God in prayer. In verses 14 and 15, John goes on to say, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that that we have asked of him. I want to sit on this for a little bit because sometimes prayer is one of those things that I feel like is that Sunday morning cliche. What's the answer? If it's not Jesus, it's probably prayer. But prayer is something that I think many of us do not take seriously. I think we miss out on what it means to pray. I think we miss out on the importance of prayer. And if we have eternal life, as we saw in verse 13, we see eternal life, we have confidence in that. And eternal life means that we have been brought into relationship with God. It means that we are no longer separated, we are no longer aliens and strangers, but we are now children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And because of that, because we have been made his child, we can now bring all things before him. And we have confidence in that. I want us to consider for a, I want us to consider for a moment the book of Esther. This might seem kind of weird. Why are we going all the way back to the book of Esther? But bear with me for a moment. Esther was made the queen in Persia. And as the queen just like every other person in the Persian Empire, if they wanted to go before the king uninvited, if they were to step into the inner court, then the king had to grant them permission to speak with him. And Esther chapter 4 verse 11 says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman gets uh, if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. Esther is in an interesting situation where there has been a law that is passed against her Jewish people that they are to be killed on a particular day. And Esther needs to go to the king and plead that this not happen. But she needs to go see the king uninvited. And she is fearful for her life because if the king does not extend the golden scepter, she will be put to death. Does not matter that she's the king or the queen. But look what happens. 
Esther chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance of the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Esther had to fear for her life to come make any kind of request known to the king that she was married to. This is not the picture that we have as Christ followers. As Christ followers, we do not have to approach the king that saved us in fear and trembling. We approach him with confidence because we are his child. We don't have to worry, is he going to hear me? Is he going to accept me? Will he, will he do what I've asked? Does he even listen or care? Yes, he hears us. Because we have been adopted, we have been made right by the shedding of his son's blood. Therefore, we can come to the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords whenever we need to. Whenever we desire to, we don't have to fear like Esther. We can go before the king and make all of our requests known. In verse 14, it says, if we ask anything, anything, a friend of mine is preaching through the book of Jude and he said in the sermon, if there is a thought in the mind of the Christian, it should be the subject, it should be a subject for prayer. If there is anything that comes to our mind, if there is anything that should cause us to have any kind of thought or consideration or anything, it should be brought to God. Anything and everything. There are no exceptions. We bring everything before God. We draw near to his throne and we make our requests known to him. And in a sermon from an old preacher, uh, one of his congregants had asked, do I bring all of the big things to God or, or can I bring the small things too? And he replied, all things are small to God. There is nothing too big. We run around in our lives and we're nervous and we're full of anxiety and we're anxious and we have hurts and we have sorrows and we think, how in the world could God ever help me with this? Nothing is big for God. Everything is small for him. And it's not to minimize what's going on in our lives. It's not to say that what we have is insignificant. We bring all of it to God. But when we ask to protect, when, when we pray with our children and they pray for our cats, you bring, that, you bring that request to God. And when you are suffering because you are sick, you bring that to God. Everything. And so what do we bring? We bring prayers for our injuries we bring prayers for financial burdens. We bring prayers for our, ang our anxieties and our depression and the temptations to sin. We bring prayers for maybe a potential job promotion. Or if you're in school, you bring prayer to God to help you through the test that's coming up. If you have hurt relationships, you bring those before the king. You bring your bitterness and unforgiveness to the king of kings and you ask for help with those. You pray for your pets. You pray for rain. You, prayed for, you pray for a renewed joy in the Lord. You pray for thanksgiving. You pray for adoration. You pray to praise God. And you pray to worship God. We take all of the things, anything that comes into our mind, and we bring it to the feet of Jesus Christ. We bring it to the king and we say, Lord, here it is. In the book of Hebrews The writer of Hebrews tells the people this, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Drawing near to the throne of grace. Unlike Esther, we don't have to fear the throne of grace. We don't have to be worried about the king sitting on the throne. We get to have confidence and draw near to him to bring everything to him. I cannot emphasize this enough because I need to hear it myself. Everything. And it seems silly when you start to think about what everything means, because everything means everything. You bring it all to him. 
And if we brought everything that's on our hearts and everything that's on our minds to God, to go back to my friend's sermon in Jude, he says, if we focused on prayer much more than we do now, I think that we'll be far less concerned about therapy when we are able to bring these things before God. It's not to say that therapy is irrelevant because there are things that happen in our life that are incredibly traumatic and we need professional help to get through them. I will not deny that in the slightest. But imagine if everything in our life is bathed and drowned in prayer. I'm not saying life gets better. I'm not saying everything will be hunky-dory and and there will be rainbows and everything like that. What I'm saying is bring it to the king. Nothing is off limits. But there's a pivotal phrase in 1 John that we need to understand. And that is when he says, according to his will. And this is a phrase that is incredibly important to understanding this passage. Because if we are to bring everything to him, we need to understand that there is his will. Though he hears everything, he will not always answer in the way we desire. He will not always give us exactly what we want. God gives. God takes away. All things come in accordance to his will. If you go to the book of Job, one of my favorite books, um, because it, it, I think it's so relatable, Job has received immense amounts of suffering. He's lost his entire family except his wife, and his wife told him to curse God and die. Job is sick. He has boils all over his body, and he's sitting on the ground, and he has nothing left to his name, nothing. All of his possessions, all of his children, everything is gone and his health is going downhill faster than I think he realizes. And in those moments, he's talking to his friends and he's, he's calling us as God, why is this happening to me? What is going on? What is the reason that I'm being afflicted with all this? And God answers him in a rare moment because God does not always answer why. But his answer is not what Job expected, I don't think. Job 38 verses four through seven God answers Job and says this, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what, on what, were, the bases, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the, morning star sang, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, and in verse 12 it says, Have you commanded the morning since your days began and cast the dawn to know and cause the dawn to know its place? God does not give an answer to Job. We know what happened to Job. We know that the enemy came to God and said, Yeah, if you do these things to Job, he'll curse you. And God said, No, he won't. Go ahead. Try it. Never happened. But when God does answer Job, he doesn't give a satisfying answer, at least I wouldn't think so. He simply says, who are you, O man? Where were you? When I created the heavens and the earth, where were you when this earth was established? Surely you know. We don't know. All things happen in accordance with his will. In Romans eight twenty-eight. God says, or Paul writes, says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good in accordance with his will, with his purpose for our good. And the question is, what is that good? Because good to me can be as small as a taco for lunch. That could be good. But Paul is not concerned with such minor things like that. What is the ultimate good in this world? It's God. All things work together for our good, and our good is to draw us closer to God. It's to bring us to him. And so no, it's not happiness. It's not material possessions or blessings. It's not relationships with other people. Our good, any good that we could ever possibly have is from God himself. And so we are to have all things, God works all things according to his purpose to draw us to himself. And I think one of the hardest places in scripture to see this played out is in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. David has sinned with Bathsheba. And the consequence of that sin is that he has a son born. But the consequence of his sin is that his son will die. 
And as his son is sick, a newborn infant, his son is sick, and David is fasting and in sackcloth and ashes on the ground. And then when his son dies, his servants don't even want to tell David because they're worried he'll hurt himself. But this is what happens when David finds out that his son finally passes. 2 Samuel 12, verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. David's first response was to clean himself up and worship God. It is, I can't even begin to comprehend what it would be like to see your son. I'm about to have a son, like in three weeks. <laughs> to see him, and then he's gone and then the response to be, I will worship God. No one's going to look at that and go, that's good. But God is so much bigger than us. He is so much greater than us. The any good that we have is him. And God has worked all things in my own life so that I would see his good. I have had rheumatic fever and open heart surgery at 18 and 19 years old. Where's the good in that? The good is that I see God, is that I have been moved to follow him, to see his mercy, to see his goodness and his grace in everything, even when life is awful. You see him. You look through the fog and you see all the, all the junk and you look past all of that and you see God himself, that he is there, that he is with you. And our prayer reveals our dependence on God because no one can get through these things on their own. No one can muscle their way through life going, I got this, I can take care of it. No, prayer is that revealing that we need to go to him for everything. And according to his will and his purpose, he will give us exactly what we need. As a parent, consider this. Our kids come up to us and request things all the time. They always want something. Do we give them every single possible thing they could ever ask for? No, because we know that that's not what they need. We know that if we gave our children everything that they would need, that they would be worse off because of it. How much better is our Heavenly Father who has perfect knowledge of exactly what we need exactly when we need it? When we bring all things to our king, to our heavenly father, there are times where he will give us what we ask. And there are times where he will say, no. I was not healed of my rheumatic fever. I was not given a literal healed heart. I had to have it surgically repaired. God did not give me divine healing because that's not what I needed. I needed him. And through that, continuous reinforcements of needing him were given. Prayer reveals our dependence on him, and if we, as parents on this earth, would be able to give our kids good things, how much better will our Heavenly Father, who is perfect in love, perfect in knowledge, perfect in understanding, perfect in wisdom, how much more will he give us exactly what we need when we need it? And how much will he tell us no when we need to hear it? And how much will he tell us not yet? In verse 15, in the ESV, it's worded kind of weird. <laughs> um, but in the NLT, it says, And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we know that he will give us what we ask for. Obviously, this is all in accordance with his will. We ask all things, anything and everything that's on our hearts, we bring it before God. And when it is in accordance to his will, he will give us those things. And as we grow in maturity and as we grow in our walk with Christ and as we become more conformed to Christ, it's not, our, it's not God's will that changes, it's our will that changes. We begin to ask for things in accordance with his will, in accordance with what he has desired of us. Because when we pray, we don't pray to change God's mind, we pray to change our own. Pray that we would be conformed to him, not him to us. Because if we are the ones in charge, if we are the ones that are taking the lead, if we are the ones that, that have the, the, the authority, everything crumbles. 
but prayer is to conform us to God. And he hears us. He hears every single one of our prayers. He hears every single one of our petitions that we make before God. And so we go to him because he loves us and because he cares for us. Because we have a God that stepped into reality for us. And I'm not requesting or I'm not saying that we all need to leave from here and set up an hour of prayer every single day. I'm not suggesting that. What I am calling for us to do instead is to be in prayer continuously. To have a mentality of prayer. Of when you're driving to work and someone cuts you off, instead of giving them responses the world might give, you pray for them. And you pray for yourself. God, give me patience. And when little things happen, like you stub your pinky toe, it's the worst in the world. But you pray for it. And when you go to the doctor and it is not what you want to hear, you pray for it. And when someone comes up to you and says, I'm really struggling right now, will you pray for me? You stop everything in that moment and you pray for them. You don't say, no, I'll go do it when I get home. Because how many of us went home and never prayed for that person? Have a mentality of constantly drawing into the throne room of grace, of constantly going to our Lord to ask for help, to constantly bringing to him everything that is on your hearts and minds. We have been made clean by the blood of, uh, by the, blood of the cross of Christ. We have the privilege of going before our king in prayer in everything. We should not waste such a privilege. But if you have no confidence... If you do not know the Lord Jesus, if you've been listening to all this and say, yeah, but I don't even know who Jesus is. I don't even know if I'm saved. I maybe went to church a couple times, but I've never put my faith and trust in Christ. Or maybe you're the person that did go up during an altar call, but you did it because all your friends did it. Or you did it because the music was just right and so you felt like maybe this is the time. Don't find confidence in things. Don't find confidence in your own works. Instead, Cry out to God for forgiveness. Put your faith and trust in him and him alone. Repent of your sins, turn away from it, and put your faith and trust in Christ. Have confidence and assurance because he has given it to you, not because you have given it to yourself. And if God is drawing you to himself, if, you have, if he has done a work in your heart and your soul this morning, I encourage you, either, after, I'm sorry, either during our closing hymn or during after the service, pardon. I encourage you to come speak with me. I'd love to hear what God is doing. I'd love to know that God is working in your heart and your mind, that he is drawing you to himself.